Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to our adult Sunday school lesson. This is for Sunday, August the 14th, 2022. Again, it's from the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. It's entitled, Seeing the Big Picture. This is really a unit of four lessons that, are, that is entitled, Coming Attractions. These four lessons will give us courage to continue in the Christian walk, even amid persecution, as the recipients to the letter to the Hebrews were facing. Last week we looked at seeking a homeland. Today it's seeing the big picture. Next week, anticipating an unshakable kingdom. And then the final lesson is having confidence. All of these are worthwhile things to look forward to. By looking at these coming attractions and keeping them in mind, our Christian love will be shared generously with strangers and fellow travelers. But beyond that, our lives must demonstrate day-to-day -day morally upright behaviors. We can't bear the name of Christ and engage in shady, sinful behavior. And so that's one of the major themes in the book of Hebrews. Uh, just by way of background, remember that the, the writer is uh, coming from a Jewish background and uh, many, and you know, the Christian church started as a sect within the Jewish uh, temple system. And so many of the first Christians were Jews and evidently at some point, some were tempted to go back to their Christian background. But the writer of Hebrews wants us to know that the synagogue is no place for a Jew. Good Jews belong in church. The book of Hebrews is loaded with theology as opposed to other lessons we've studied recently from the Gospels where we were focusing more on the words and deeds of Jesus. The book of Hebrews is loaded with theology and what we are to make of it. Uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews is the famous roll call of the faithful. And that's been our text for the last two weeks, last week and then again, again this week. It's a, one of the most famous chapters in the whole Bible because it outlines uh, and shows that many people in the Old Testament were models of faith. And if you read only the Old Testament, you don't get that teaching because they're not singled out for their faith. On the contrary, they're singled out for their continuing sinfulness falling off the cliff and God forgiving and redeeming them. And uh, the writer of Hebrews wants us to know that they can be seen as models of faith. Uh, the book of Hebrews, it seems to me, has a lot, much ado about high priests. So uh, within the, the role of uh, the Israelite faith or Judaism, priests were held to a high standard and the most exalted of those priests was the high priest. And so uh, there is lots of teaching in this book that compares Jesus to a mysterious high priest named Melchizedek. And uh, all of these latter three dot points don't mean much to me as a person who came to faith outside of a Jewish background, but uh, to those who, whose Christian faith is rooted in the, in the Old Testament faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, these are important uh, points. When I hear the words, the big picture, it's in my DNA. I can't help but think of the old 1950s program that was on once a week called The Big Picture, which was produced by the Army Signal Corps as an aftermath of World War II. This man I saw every week, Master Sergeant Stuart Queen, who would come on and talk about various aspects of World War II and the Americans' response to it and what that means to us. Uh, I can't not think, see the words, the big picture, and think of Stuart Queen and, and the big picture. But the writer of Hebrews wants us to see in the Christian big picture that faith entails suffering. Faith has both conquest, which is positive, but also suffering, which is negative. So the big picture is 
that we have to take a broad view of things and not think that everything's going to be smooth sailing. There will be some bumps along the road and even suffering. Today's lesson is in three acts, three portions of scripture. In act one of the scripture, we're going to look at faith in action. Uh, it required faith for the children of Israel to cross the Red Sea as they were being pursued by Pharaoh's army. That same faith that allowed the children of Israel to escape bondage also allowed them to conquest Jericho and uh, to find a, a homeland. It required uh, the faith of a person named Rahab to help uh, the, the Jewish spies spy out the land so that they could lay conquest and be successful. Act 2, the second portion of our scripture, is more detail about the positive and negative aspects of faith. We think of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah. There are many conquests, but also some, uh, some downsides, some suffering that they all had to go through. And there were many other persecutions that are mentioned especially in the apocryphal books, which we do not have in the Protestant uh, Old Testament. But uh, if you look at the book of Maccabees, the, you'll see that God's faithful were persecuted to death, but rather than renounce their faith, they chose to die instead of renouncing their faith. So they are role models of what it means to, to carry faith. And that takes us to the third portion of scripture the faithful persevere and keep on maintaining their faith even in the midst of severe persecution to the extent that there we now have a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering for us in our spiritual walk these witnesses we call martyrs there's a great band of christian martyrs who are helping us cheering for us wanting the best for us as we progress along our spiritual pilgrimage. And there's no greater example of that than Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. This third part of the scripture uses that word perfecter, which occurs only one time in the whole Bible. So Jesus is the pioneer. He blazed the trail and he perfected the faith that we are participating in. So that's what the lesson would have us understand. I found this quote, that faith is not about everything turning out okay. Some things are not going to turn out to our satisfaction. But faith is about being okay no matter how things do turn out. That is what I am seeking to appropriate into my spiritual life. I'm not there yet. I still get angry and mad and lose heart when things don't go just the way I think they should go. But a conquering faith says that in the big picture of things, our future is secure. So no matter where events lead us, God is ultimately in control and things will turn out better in the long run. That's what the big picture entails. Not looking at short term only, but today and eternity. Look beyond the earth. One summary slide is that wherefore seeing we're also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight you know a runner you don't need extra weight when you're running a, a race and the sin which does easily beset us let us run with patience the race that is set before us this is the keystone verse that we'll be looking at today so the Christian life is really a spiritual journey. Uh, we're different today than we were yesterday, and hopefully we'll be better and different tomorrow than we are today. In Hebrews chapter 11, the focal passage for both last week and this week, the noun faith, this Greek word pistis, occurs 23 times. Uh, Faith occurs in the midst of much, much persecution in the history of Israel. 
You know, I, I'm not a Jew myself, but after the Holocaust, we're all Jews because of the terrible persecution they faced in World War II. And it's not isolated just to the 20th century that the children of Israel has faced so much persecution. There are many additional details in the Apocrypha during the reign of the Maccabees when the faithful were put to death rather than to renounce their faith in God. And the writer of these apocryphal books says that it seems unjust that God would allow these faithful witnesses to die without vindication. So if they did not receive their reward or vindication on earth, a just God would see that they are rewarded in heaven. And this to me is the crossover point when it comes to the biblical teaching of an afterlife. Uh, I'll say more about it as we look at the scripture, but in our text today, it uses the word that's translated witness. It, if we transliterate those Greek characters into their English equivalents, it's the word martyr. So prior to this writing, the word witness meant just you testify, you bore witness, you, you, you uh, said something in court. But after this, the word also carries the connotation of bearing witness even to the point of death or becoming a martyr. So this word martyr is one who, being put to death, bears witness to the truth of the gospel. That is the full-fledged, mature meaning of the word in, in Christian writings. A martyr is one who's put to death for religious faith, as Stephen was the first Christian martyr. But this Greek word, martyreo, you can see that if you transliterate the, the Greek characters, M-A-R-T-Y-R, it actually meant witness. And that's the way it's translated in many scriptures. But beginning in this text in Hebrews, chapter 11, the word took on the meaning of dying for one's faith. So if we bear witness to the Christian faith, we not only speak up, but we continue to maintain the faith even if it costs us our life. So, as I say, immortality in the Old Testament, it's not taught in the law of Moses. There are some vague mentions of Sheol, the place of the dead, and dwelling in the house of the Lord to the end of the age. But there's no defined teaching that talks about a heavenly ward. But the crossover point seems to be in the apocryphal books, these books of Maccabees where the faithful were being put to death. And the argument is that an unjust God would not allow that. A just God would see that the faithful are vindicated, if not in this life, then in the next life. But by Jesus' day, some factions did believe in the resurrection, like the Pharisees, and some did not, like the Sadducees. But it seems to me that immortality stems from the justice of God. A just God would not allow the faithful to perish without vindication. So all New Testament commentators, apologists, have carried with them the idea that uh, we will dwell with the Lord in heaven at some point. It's not a question. It's not an open question any longer for us. So let's read Act 1, Hebrews 11, 29 to 31. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. So faith has a corporal face and also an individual face. True faith always receives its reward. It is never in, in vain. God vindicates either here or in heaven. God is always just. The faith that produced a dry path across the Red Sea 
for the children of Israel is now the faith that brings down the walls of Jericho. This faith is communal and individual. It mentions Rahab, a person who may be a sinner, but whose actions of faith was instrumental in uh, conquering the land. So, some aspects of faith. To witness and to testify, if we have faith, it's what this Greek word means. Martyr is one who bears witness or testifies to the truth. This text in Hebrews is the first documented use of the word for testify to mean to die for the faith, to become a martyr. The uh, Rodman commentator is very big to make this point that, that this scripture may be one of the reasons why it's so uh, uh, it's included in the canon because of its, its teaching regarding this word to maintain your faith to the death. The Hebrew preacher says that faith requires us to bear witness to the workings of God in our life, even to the point of death as a martyr. This is a hard teaching. And this is the teaching that many were not willing to do, evidently. They were renouncing the faith so that they could escape persecution. But the, the Hebrew preacher says that's not God's intent. So let's move on to Act 2. There's a bit more text here. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon... Barak, Samson, Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, ordained or obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all of these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, without us, be made perfect. Wow, there is so much teaching in these verses. You can see that even the writer says he doesn't have time to talk about all the dimensions of faith. But we know of people being conquered by Gideon and Barak and David and Samuel. Uh, the, these women who were talked about who received their dead by resurrection. Um, this is kind of an obscure reference, but it probably refers to episodes in 1 Kings and 2 Kings where the prophet Elijah resurrected a widow's son and the prophet Elisha uh, raised uh, a, a dead young man also, resurrected them because of the faith that their mothers had demonstrated. Uh, but these Maccabean martyrs, they chose death rather than to renounce their faith in God. Some were stoned or sawed in two. There's a tradition that the prophet Isaiah was sawed in two by a wooden saw by the bad king. Uh, so common people, prophets, many in the history of Israel suffered greatly because of their faith. It says that their faith was not vindicated by God on earth because God had a better plan for them, a heavenly reward. Wow, what a teaching. So faith conquers everything in the long run. God is just, thus 
the faithful will be vindicated. We have to believe that. So let's move on to the last few verses. Therefore, whenever you see that word, you need to make note because something important is coming. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So, therefore, we are surrounded that's a fact statement. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, even martyred witnesses. We should lay aside every weight of sin and run with perseverance. Our model is Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. That word occurs only one time in the Bible. We are not a perfecter of the faith. We are seeking to model what Jesus did on our behalf. So, Jesus made a joyful decision to endure the pain and shame of the cross in order to take his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. This speaks to the cryptology that the Hebrew preacher mentions, that Jesus' exalted status, which we'll say more about in the coming two weeks. We have a great cloud of witnesses. There are so many Christian martyrs. We think we have it rough and we may go through times in our life where we suffer uh, tragedy and loss, but others before us have also done so. So we have many faithful witnesses that are cheering for us as we run. I love this image that the run of faith is a marathon, not a sprint. We don't want to get burned out thinking, you know, we just have to hang in there for a couple of weeks and then we're done. No, our Christian faith is a lifelong pursuit as if we are running a marathon and not a, a short race. Let us run that race with endurance, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. So the Christian pilgrimage is an endurance run. I, I, here is a, a book out of my library, which I can uh, recommend wholeheartedly. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a great devotional classic. It uh, lists many of the Christian martyrs, starting with the, uh, Jesus and Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And it lists many others. It's a great devotional read. Highly recommend you look at it. Issues for us today... The big picture of faith includes our heavenly goal as well as our earthly blessings and struggles. A mature faith keeps on going in spite of pain and setbacks, looking to Jesus as the author and perfecter of our faith. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on. We keep Jesus' words and deeds as guideposts in our pilgrimage. So thanks for joining me today. Remember not to take me too seriously. The scripture doesn't come with instructions on how it's to be interpreted. My way of doing it is only one way. I hope you'll find a way that suits you and that you'll connect with the Sunday school class so that you can share your views of scripture. Remember our prayer concerns that increase daily and weekly. And uh, I'll see you next week as we continue our preview of coming attractions. Thank you again, Daryl, for... Uh, all your many uh, deeds that help us get these lessons recorded. And till next week, goodbye.